Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Lunch and Learn on Birds. Uh, we are excited to share with you. My name is Nina, and myself, along with uh, the presenter here, Denise, are your conservation educators at the Assemble Bayfield Conservation Authority. Um, we are excited to present this webinar to you, just one in a series that we've been doing. So keep an eye out for future ones. Um, and before we get started today, we would like to acknowledge that we are located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, Mississauga, and Attawandrunk peoples. Um, we would like to acknowledge their long uh, stewardship of the land and the work that we do with them today to share that stewardship to keep our land, water, and all living things healthy and well. I will turn it over to Denise. Thank you, Nina. It's exciting to be here today and I uh, thought I'd share this fun little um, little screenshot of why birding is my favorite video game. I'm actually not that into video games, but uh, uh, there's so many cool reasons why you can bird watch. And uh, of course, there's some drawbacks as well. Um, so have a look. Which one's your favorite, Nina? You know, I really like that you can, the multiplayer support. I love that you can bird with, with everyone, young, old, of lots of varieties of abilities. It's birdings for everybody. Yeah, so true, so true. And so, this is just an introduction to backyard birding basics. Um, we've almost missed the window for looking at just winter birds because I keep seeing spring birds coming back. And uh, when it's winter time, you're looking at a few less resident birds uh, in the neighborhood. What's the, the, the most recent bird sighting for you, Nina? Oh, this morning I saw my first turkey vulture of the spring. They are my favorite large bird. They are pretty cool and they, they help clean up the spring mess. So <laughs> when it comes to bird watching, there's nothing that you really need to get started, um, but there's a few helpful things that uh, definitely make life a little bit easier because we're always asking the question, what bird is it? But you really don't need to know what bird it is to enjoy bird watching. So some self helpful things to have are field guides, um, or even phones, uh, you can put apps on your phones like the Merlin Bird ID app, uh, app, which is very helpful. And some of the questions that we're gonna go through today actually are the same questions that um, Merlin Bird ID app asks you. So uh, it's about asking those questions in your head or Merlin Bird ID app can like guide you through those questions that you should be answering about birds. Um, binoculars or your a camera could be helpful. Uh, a notepad and a pencil. Um, when it comes to birding, um, some people like to keep a list of all the birds that they've seen and identified. I started my list and I think I'm gonna have to go back to my list for all the, the birds that I've seen um, over the years as I, as I started watching birds. So this is also an example of a, 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 just a basic bird guide. And some of them are you know smaller and some of them are bigger. So. Um, it doesn't take much to get started learning about birds. So when it comes to figuring out what bird you're seeing, uh, this is probably a familiar bird to most of you, but there are clues that we can look for and we can be a detective in trying to figure that out. And uh, there are six S words. And so hopefully this will be helpful in, in remembering what to look for when it comes to figuring out what kind of birds are around. So the first one is season. The first clue that we need to look at is the season. And uh, um, Nina, what would you say the season is right now? Well, that has I looked to the side because I'm looking out the window. Um, if you ask me right today, just based on today's weather, I would say it was spring. 
Um, but I think it is still, even though it's spring-like in the weather, I think it's still winter. Yeah, it is. It's technically still winter, at least for another week and a bit. But all of the seasons, uh, you're going to get different birds uh, coming and going and migrating and nesting and um They'll be doing different activities at different seasons. So it's important just to remember that when you go out, think about the season that it is, and that will um, give you also an idea of what uh, kind of birds you're going to see. So I'm going to quiz you right now, Nina. Would you see this bird in the winter? No. No. We can verify that with a, a phone app or uh, a book, an ID guide, and we can look at the different areas um, for this bird, it's been tracked and studied. And we can see that it breeds in our area. The green circle is the area that we're in. So um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Assault Bayfield Conservation Area, or authority, I mean, we are in an area of Southern Ontario, which is in Canada. And we have um, majority of Huron County, we have Lansing County and uh, um, Middlesex. Uh, that um, in that area. So when we're looking at birds that are in our area and birds that we're talking about today, we're talking about Southern Ontario and birds of the Assault Bayfield watershed. So the hummingbird is known to breed in the summertime in our area. And you can look at the non-breeding time, which is uh, in Central and South uh, Central America, there are parts of Mexico. So that bird is on its way back and it should be here probably early May. If you look for the trilliums, phenology is actually something that uh, uh, is also good to look at as you're walking around and looking for birds, but birds are also triggered to come back based on what's going on in our, in our, uh, in our watershed, like with, what's happening with our plants and trees. So um, here's another one. Would you see this bird in the summer? It's a dark-eyed junco. Uh, I'm gonna say no. You're gonna say no, and you're correct again. Um, this one is tricky though, because all around us, to the east and to the west, it's actually year-round resident. And in this small area of Southern Ontario, we only have it in during the non-breeding season, which would be like during winter. And then if we go look and look to the north, the, the breeding area would be northern parts of Ontario and across Canada. So um, this is a, is a cool little bird and hope to talk about more about these birds later, but I'm just getting through some of the basics of bird ID right now. Would you see this bird in the fall, Nina? Oh, I love chickadees. Um, yes. And just checking with uh, the local uh, book as we could do. Uh, this bird is year round through all uh, the middle parts of North America. So definitely would see this bird in the fall. You've got three for three, Nina. Good job. <laughs> so the second thing and second and third things kind of mixed together and the size and the shape. Um, uh, especially with the Merlin bird ID app, it actually will ask you, is this bird larger than a goose, smaller than a crow, bigger than a crow, robin, and sparrow? These are some of the most common birds that you should be familiar with. And the size of the bird and the shape of the bird is going to help you with figuring out what kind of bird you have. So here's uh, the shape clues. So look at that. If, if you look at silhouettes of these birds, we might only see silhouettes when the sun is shining or maybe in a shady forested area. So you might only see a silhouette. And uh, what's one thing you notice about the goose silhouette, Nina? It's got a very long neck. Yes, a goose silhouette, you'll have that long neck um, as compared to the other birds, which are going to be a smaller and smaller. And uh, yeah, the silhouette uh, is very helpful to know. and just knowing four silhouettes is going to get you on your way to knowing more about the bird. Um, I have a, a silhouette quiz for you. What bird is this? We just saw it on the previous screen. Oh, um, it's a robin. 
<laughs> you are correct. Uh, I'll just flip back and forth. So you can see that the silhouette of the bird, even though you don't see the colors, uh, you can figure out what um, the shape is. And if it's a very common bird, the shape is gonna help you with identifying that bird. Now, for, as for size, I've included some information on the, on the right there about the length, the weight, and the wingspan. And looking at the length and the, and the wingspan, those numbers you can look up in a, in a handy bird guide or, or app on your phone. Uh, but there, there's lots more information found within the, these kinds of things if you want to know more. So yeah, just looking at shape is going to, to help you out. So here's the quest, uh, uh, here's the test now for shape, Nina. And uh, as we go through, we'll just go through number one first and we'll go on to number four. And so I know you know a little bit about birds, so I'm hoping that we'll get four for four. What's your guess for the first one? All right, well, the first one I can tell that it's on a tree and has a pretty strong looking beak. So my guess would be a woodpecker. You are correct. And we don't even have to figure out what kind of woodpecker it is because if we get to the, even the stage of figuring out what the shape is and it's a woodpecker, you've, you're on your way to solving all of the clues. So um, woodpeckers do, I'll note that their tails are usually balancing them against the tree as well. So uh, the, the fact that the tail is touching the tree is another, another hint. Okay, what about number two? Mm, number two looks like a gliding bird, so maybe a hawk. A hawk. You've got that. Yeah. So <laughs> you can look, uh, especially if that bird is flying up in the sky, it has the wings outstretched and, and it has a general shape to it. Um, and different, as you look more and more about hawks, you'll, you'll see that the, the ends of the wings might be a little bit different and the tail of, of the, um, the hawk might be a bit different too, but the general shape is kind of compact, large wing. Uh, good job. Okay, number three. Well, this one looks a lot like the goose silhouette, but with a shorter neck. So is it a duck? You are correct. Yes, I thought I'd throw that one in because yeah, the neck height and, and length is different. And uh, yeah, a duck is a little more squished together and a little bit smaller than a goose. Um, number four. Oh, I think these are my favorite birds. I believe this is an owl silhouette. You are correct. Uh, definitely an owl. How'd you know it was an owl? Well, the way it's sitting sort of upright in some of the other silhouettes, they were, their legs were further back on their body, maybe, or they were like slanted. It's a weird way of describing it. Um, and they're very uh, robust. Yes, robust, good word. <laughs> so yeah, so you got four to four and, and, and now we know uh, some more shapes and silhouettes that we can go forward with learning more about birds. So here's, um, here's another one. Just to throw in a little bit of a mix, there are birds that actually have similar silhouettes. Ooh. So now you need to find which one is of the blue jay. A, B, C, or D? Um, I'm going to guess B. You are correct. Was okay. there a second guess that you were like, oh, it could be? My second guess was C, but the, the, the mohawk on the bird looked a little bit too smooth. <laughs> mohawk, also known as a crest or a crown. Uh, the, all of these had some kind of crest or crown, but also the shape of the body and the tail feathers give us a clue as to um, the kind of bird that we're seeing. So yeah, you guessed that right. Wow, good job. <laughs> There's more to come. Good job. Okay, so if you're biking, walking, hiking, driving uh, down the road, you might actually just see a, like a wave of shape and so, yeah, this could be a typical roadside silhouette, but yeah, that's a lot of birds right there. Nina, can you find the sparrow and tell me the number? 
We've already seen the sparrow, remember, compared to a blue jay. Oh, that's it's true. A robin um, or an owl. Which one is the sparrow? Is the sparrow... Okay, so I'm going to... I think the sparrow is one of the ones that is on the wires. Yes, I'll agree with you. Sparrows are pretty small. Um, so it's either two, five, or six. But six seems to have too long of a tail, so I'm going to say like two or five. And I'm unwilling to commit. <laughs> okay. And that's okay, because you've narrowed it down. Uh, it is two. All right. Yay. But th there's some birds in this roadside picture that I found on the internet that has some birds that we don't have here. But bird mm -hmm. families are definitely uh, have similar sizes and shapes. And now we're going to get into the colors, which we call special marking. Uh, and when you look at a bird, you can call it the chin or the, the throat. Um, um, wing bars are another thing to look at. <clears throat> and then the overall color. So definitely color is going to help you beyond finding out what size and shape it is. So what three colors do you see here, Nina? And Black, white, and brown. Yeah, and this is what the, the Merlin Bird ID app will ask you is what three colors, like what are the top three colors that you see? And and actually it's programmed to bring you back some similar birds based on size, shape, and color. Um, but there are actually a lot of birds that are brown, white, and black. <laughs> they call them little brown jobbies if you don't know what they are or LBJs, that's some insight into some birding terminology. So here's a question for you. Look at the bird on the left. What three colors do you see there? Gray, white, and pink? Sure. Does, is this similar to the colors of the bird on the right? Yeah, I would say more of a brown than a gray, though. Yeah, they're they're similar though. What what's the difference? Do you, like when we're looking at birds, we'll, we now have to figure out what the special markings are that are different between them. And the first thing that I notice is the beak. They're slightly different. One's uh, a little more robust, and one's kind of uh, thinner and pointier and more yellow. That's the one on, on the left. Do you notice anything different between the two? Uh, the bird on the right has more of a more of a mohawk, which I believe you said was <laughs> called a crest, than and the other bird is more of a, a smooth head. Smooth, yes. But they both have red on their head. Uh, this bird is actually called a uh, common red bull. And over here, this is a purple print finch. Now, just to throw some, like, purple finch is kind of like, it's, it's the coloring of it. It's pretty red or purpley, and it's like it's been dipped into some grape juice. And it's <laughs> off. Now, to throw something else into the mix here, here's another red and gray and white bird or buff color. And they're all similar in size. And mm -hmm. shape, but now we're looking at the special markings. So those special markings help us figure them apart. With this new bird in the mix, what's different between often the bird on the right, which I'll get my laser pointer out, and this bird are confused with each other? What's the difference that you see? The bird at the top has different like wing markings. Yeah, like a wing bar is almost there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the coloration, like depending on how, how you see it, but the coloration of the bird at the top, which is a house finch, is more orangey than purpley so, mm -hmm. in color. So yeah, we're, we're learning about special markings and these are all clues that help us figure out what kind of bird we're looking at. So the fifth thing to look at is the site that you're at. And so you can pick different sites to look at and four different birds. So you can pick a forest. Um, would you find a goose in a forest, Tina? 
Unless there was some, you know what? I'm going to say no because even when there's a forest right beside the right beside the woods, the river, because the woods is a forest, um, they don't. They're, they're feature sensitive. The they don't like the sticks. Yeah, they they like the open area. They like the water. So yeah, you wouldn't find a goose in a forest. Uh, and so you can think about that as you go to different sites. Here's the shores of Lake Huron. Now, of course, all birds need water to survive. So yeah, you're gonna get most birds maybe making a trip to water. But what about an owl? Would you see an owl flying over the water normally? I don't think so, because they don't, I don't know of any owls that eat fish. Yeah, it, it's not very common to see an owl there. Uh, would you see a great blue heron at the beach? Maybe, but I think they like calmer water. So maybe not Lake Huron, but maybe a smaller lake. Yeah, I would agree with you. Yeah, you know a little bit more about birds. When it comes to behavior, this is where behavior and the site that you're going to uh, behavior of the birds and the sites kind of start mixing in together and providing more clues. Would you see a duck in the Asabo River? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's a forest. Um, and of course, uh, birds looking for water, um, they're definitely going to be around water for some point of their life. Okay, last clue to look for is, or look for, listen to is the sounds that you're hearing. And there's a ton of different sounds, especially in the spring, of the different types of calls and songs. So alarm calls, begging calls, contact calls, which is birds just communicating with each other. It's like a, usually a pip or um, a peep. Uh, the um, chickadees are known for this, talking to each other that, uh, because they do kind of tend to fly around in flocks. And so they're pipping and peeping to each other to let them know um, where they are. Uh, flight calls, uh, of course, geese, you hear them flying and they're, they're uh, honking in, in the sky. And so they're, they're talking to each other while they're flying. And then, of course, we have songs too, especially of uh, songbirds that put out beautiful um, melodies of sounds when, when, they're, when, when they're, especially in the spring, when they're happy, we'll call it the happy song. Um, going back to begging calls, so if you hear begging calls, that's a, a hatchling of birds waiting for food. So if you hear birds cheeping and peeping like crazy, you actually are probably close to a nest. And so if you stop and look and figure out where that sound is coming from, you might actually see the nest. You might see the birds in the nest. And you might even see um, the birds being fed by the parents, which would be pretty cool. So listening to all of these different calls and, and going back to alarm calls, uh, a bird might do an alarm call, um, like a cardinal will set, up, set out an alarm call if there's a predator in the area, or maybe they're, they're alarm calling about you being in their area. So <laughs> there could be a pair of them close by. Um, other sounds that birds make, uh, as you mentioned, uh, about birds with their woodpecker and their pointy beak, uh, you can hear them drumming on logs and trees, even wing beats or noises from flying. The morning dove is especially known for like hearing the <laughs> as it flies away or bill snaps and clacks. And if you go down to the water and you encounter a goose, you might get some snapping um, of their beaks to warn you away. And then of course, scratching noises, those that are they're scratching with their, their talons on the forest floor looking for food. So there's all kinds of sounds of different birds to listen to and listening to where the sounds are coming from are going to lead you to where the bird is. And hopefully you can gather all the information about size, shape, special markings uh, to help you identify that bird. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit about some bird mnemonics, which this is putting words to what you hear. And some of these birds are definitely not birds you, would, uh, you wouldn't find in the winter, but there's some really neat mnemonics, some words that we can uh, learn in our heads and associate with a certain call of a bird. 
one one that I like is the oven bird and the word is teacher teacher but actually it's a kind of like an annoying student <laughs> making a, a noise like teacher 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 and that's like the oven bird and I have that uh, rolling around in my head as I go out um, hiking. Nina do you have a bird call that kind of like you have a mnemonic that's in your head and could you do that for us if you have one? You know, I am, don't have one. I'm not very good at mnemonics. I, I don't have one, sorry. That is okay. Um, I'll do uh, one more. Uh, at the top, we have the uh, white-throated sparrow. And uh, it's kind of a patriotic bird. Uh, the words up there are, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. And it sounds... It's got more of a melody than what I'll say, but it's, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. So there's a longer um, notes that are held by this bird when it's uh, singing its song. Yeah, there's a great cat bird in the middle. Sounds like, actually sounds like a cat in the forest. So double check, uh, look for a cat on the ground and then there's probably a cat bird in the, in, in the tree. Now, of course, we all like birds and keep them around. There are seven simple actions that we can do to help birds. Now, this information in this graphic came from um, three million, no, three billion birds um, dot org. And that's from a study that said that we've lost over three billion birds. And we are continuing to, to lose more birds. And some reasons why we lose birds um, are part of these seven reasons. So I'll just, just read through them. And you can think about maybe taking one of these as an action that you can do to keep, um, keep birds maybe on your property and keep birds safe um, from, from dying. So here we are. I'll start from left to right. Uh, drink shade, grow in coffee, because the shade of the trees provides um, habitat for birds when uh, there's a lot of coffee that is grown in, in direct sun and we lose forests that way. Uh, reduce plastic use. Do citizen science. Uh, and Merlin Bird ID app or eBird uh, is also a good app to add your sightings to. Make windows safer. I don't know if you've put up any kind of uh, silhouettes of birds on windows or sometimes you put little dots on windows that break up the reflection on the window so that birds don't think that it's like a blue sky habitat that they're flying through uh, because of the reflection, they can't, they can't tell um, or see into the window a lot of times, so they hit windows. Uh, keep your cats indoors. There are so many cats that are uh, suspect of like eating and catching and maybe not even eating, but catching birds, uh, especially songbirds when they're, when they're singing. Uh, use native plants, and we're all for that at the Conservation Authority. Plant uh, native plants because they, they grow best here, and the animals will use them, like the birds. And avoid pesticides, and reducing that will limit the exposure to the birds. So seven simple actions. Pick one, try one, maybe two, and help the birds. So I'm going to continue into a few more uh, guess who. Uh, with Nina's help here, uh, and uh, we'll guess what the no, no, noisiest bird is. Like in the whole world? Well, this is my impression of a winter bird. What is the noisiest bird? Oh, so, winter bird. Yeah. Uh, around here, I would say chickadees, because they're everywhere and they love to sing. Okay, well, here's your hint. I was wrong. <laughs> um, that is not a chickadee. That is a blue jay? Yes. Uh, I do. I went back and forth between chickadee and blue jay, though. Uh, blue jays, I wanted to say that they make such a wide range of noises, not just one call, but a few calls. They can mimic other birds and mimic other noises that might be um, heard in your neighborhood. And blue jays are very loud. <laughs> and they are very loud. And usually there's a whole like group of them called a party. So a party of jays is 
allowed allowed grouping. Uh, if you want to attract them to your, your yard, I have some suggestions. And I have some calls. I think I have. Oh, that didn't work. Escape. Sorry. It's going well. I knew I should have checked the, the sounds before I. We'll just skip the sounds. It says it's uh, its own name. J, J, J. What bird is a master of survival? What bird is a master of survival? Um, in the winter, master of survival. Here's your hint. Sparrows. Is that is that a sparrow? It's a My chickadee. guess is a sparrow. It's a <laughs> ball in there everywhere. I was wrong. It's a chickadee. <laughs> well, my reasoning for this is chickadees they'll tend to like gather food and hide it. So they'll take a seed from from the feeder. They'll hide it in the bricks or stones around a house or underneath bark so they'll keep hiding food and they don't necessarily go back to those places where they've hidden the food but they do tend to hide food for for later and you can attract them to your feeder they do love black oil sunflower seed and peanuts and the chickadee does say its name so a bird mnemonic for for uh the chickadee is Chickadee dee dee, or chickadee dee, and uh, and they do have um, little pips of sounds that they go back and forth with to let each other know where they are. Guess who? What bird is an expert tree climber? A nuthatch. Yes. They can climb upside down. You, you don't even need the hint. You've got it. The nuthatch. And notice, compared to the woodpecker. It's smaller in size and the tail doesn't touch the tree. And yeah, it goes head first down and uh, it gives it another perspective for looking for food. So I have two varieties of nut patches uh, to talk about here. And you can see this, this similar size and shape. So we got those S's. Uh, the sounds are slightly different, but you can see the special markings are, uh, unique so more of a, a cap on um, on the heads of them but then there's an eye stripe for the the red breast of that hatch and also a bit of a red belly so uh, those are the nut hatches good job i have another one well if you want to attract them to your feeder of course black oil sunflower seed is kind of a universal seed to put out for any bird you're going to get a good variety um, Peanuts, if you add peanuts to your feeder, you might also get squirrels. What bird is part of the feeder cleanup crew? Oh, so when I think of birds I've seen on the ground at the base of a feeder, I'm going to say a dark-eyed junco. Dark-eyed junco. And I went back and forth with this one too, but... Oh, that is not a dark-eyed junco. <laughs> That's a dove or a pigeon? Dove, yes, the morning dove. And uh, bird mnemonic for this one is hula hoop, but they actually say it more like a cooing sound, and it sounds kind of sad too. So it's like hula hoop. hoop, hoop. You want to track them to your feeder, there's they'll clean up anything at the base or the bottom of a feeder. Uh, corn, black oil, sunflower seed, striped sunflower seed, peanut, white millet, like they'll, they'll be there. So um, I know I've had them at my feeder this year at cleaning up. <laughs> okay, what pair of birds make the prettiest couple? I'm going to say cardinals because they're different colors, the males and the females. There's your hint. You didn't even need a hint this time. 
So the Northern Cardinals, definitely. You can see that they're the same size and shape, but the special markings are different even between the same species here. So um, the similarities would be the, the beak, the orange beak, and the black um, patch around the beak. And they both have crests and the coloring is, is different for sure. Uh, the female has the, the red highlights, but more buffy olive color. And then the male is pretty much completely red. And that helps with um, camouflage for the female when she's nesting. And then the male being so colorful, he can distract any predators away. And at least my eyes always drawn to the red male cardinal. If you want to attract them to your feeder, there's millet, uh, sapphire seeds, milo, um, black oil sunflower seed is another one, but I will say I have, I put just black oil sunflower seed out and I don't get very many cardinals. So I think I do need some of the smaller seeds around for them. Now, if you can whistle, you can whistle like a cardinal and uh, especially in springtime, you can attract them um, a little bit closer and get a better view if you can uh, imitate their call. Do you know how to make the cardinal call, Nina? It sounds a little bit like pew, pew, pew. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I'm going to do my best whistle, and this is like not a great whistle, but. And cardinals, once again, they do have uh, quite a few other calls. You can um, even put words to some mnemonics to their calls, like purdy, 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 or what cheer, what cheer, what cheer. Uh, they have quite a, a range of noises, sounds they make as well. Okay, I think that's the end of my quiz for you, Nina. You did well with my uh, yeah. bird, bird quizzes today and finding out the clues to discovering um, the different types of birds that are in the area. I'll just make a couple of notes on a few of the other birds. So throughout this presentation, we, we will have gone through about 12 to 14 different birds. And so you can add more to your list as you learn more about the different birds. When it comes to hairy and downy woodpeckers, it's the size that's the major difference. Uh, you can see the hairy is on the left. It's the larger one and the downy woodpecker is smaller. We know that these are both males or, uh, because of the red patch on the back of their heads. The females are just black and white. And then the size of the beak, you can see the beaks uh, are different in size as well. But, uh, uh, but if you have, if you only see one at a time, it does become a little more difficult to tell which one you've seen. They definitely love suet and black oil sunflower seed. American goldfinches, they'll soon, uh, the male breeding plumage is bright yellow and black. And so soon they'll be changing their color a little bit and uh, they'll not be as uh, drab as they are right now with the, uh, the yellowish grayish color that they are. Attract them to your feeder with uh, Niger seed, that's a good one, or black oil sunflower seed. And usually they do come in groups or flocks to your feeder. And then finally, uh, the dark-eyed junco. Uh, once again, it makes its way down here in the winter. So when it comes uh, to seasons and what birds to look out for. So when you see this bird in the fall, you know that winter's coming. And when you, it's hard to know when you last saw a junco, but when the juncos leave, you know that spring and summer is, is on its way. So I think last year I saw one about middle of April. So it was kind of slow for the juncos to leave last year. Attract them to your feeder. As Nina mentioned, they are part of the cleanup crew as well. They, they like being down below the feeder. So they'll, they'll pick at anything that's below the feeder. And I just want to say that's the end of my presentation. And uh, we have one coming uh, up for Lunch and Learn on March 26th at uh, 12 noon on the YouTube channel or tune in by Zoom and you can get that link, those links through our website. 
on Get to Know Your H2O, Nina. Very exciting. Yes. All right, <laughs> folks. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us to learn a little bit about our some of our common